back in person to worship with you this morning. I've actually been online the last couple of weeks. Uh, my wife and I have been trading off illnesses since our daughters start going to uh, daycare. Um, but it feels good to be back. I've, I've actually been here at the church almost every day for the past month, working on my dissertation on the third floor. The church is usually empty when I'm here, but occasionally I'll run into some of you outside the church on my way into the building. Or we'll meet some of the Muslim students in the evening as they break their fast. I met some of the Korean congregants during one of their pizza parties upstairs. And sometimes when it gets really quiet, I can hear choirs practicing in the nave. The sound of the voices and the organ lifts up all throughout the building. These brief encounters have been important to me as I chip away at the dissertation I have preparing, been preparing to write for years. The subjects I am writing and thinking about are not easy. I often spend hours in my office contemplating the horrors of slavery through the recollections of Frederick Douglass or the dehumanizing reality of Jim Crow with the writings of Du Bois. It helps to have contact with others to bring me back to the present and out of my head. It helps to be reminded of how far we have come as a nation and the freedoms we often take for granted. A few weekends ago, I was having a particularly troubled time. In all three of his autobiographies, Douglas recounts a particular instance of his cousin being beaten at the whipping post. What stood out to him was the unique brutality of these beatings. The personal nature of the hatred the owner held for this woman who rejected his advances and the religious hypocrisy accompanying these vicious and public whippings. In between swings of the whip, the master would recite Luke 12, 47. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Modern translations of this verse tend to soften the language a bit. The term a severe beating is substituted for the more visceral beaten with many stripes, which refers to the bloody tracks left by the whip. I paced the halls of Union Church for days, thinking about this moment in the life of Frederick Douglass. I thought about what it means to subvert the liberatory message of the Gospels and the drive to dominate and hurt others. And how all those who claim the Christian message have to contend with the religious trauma embedded in America and in our bodies. I only bring up this story to highlight the intimate connection between the cross and the lynching tree between the reality of Jesus' death compared with how that suffering is interpreted through faith. One of my advisors in seminary wrote a book called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Dr. Cohn wanted to draw on the similarities between the suffering of Jesus and all of those ground underneath the savagery of history. 
Satan can quote the gospel just as you or I can. What makes our declaration of the saving message of Jesus as the Christ meaningful is the love, faith, and hope we express in its telling. Our gospel message this morning is about heartache and trauma, but not only that. It is about the faith that comes through finding hope in Jesus Christ and in the community of love built in his name. Take a moment and let your imagination travel back to the time between the crucifixion and Pentecost, a time of waiting, revelation, and mystery. A time when all that had been hoped for had been shattered and the body of your beloved teacher broken. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. The disciples were spending whole nights and days out on the sea fishing and returning to shore with empty nets. But on this day, just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered, no. Then Jesus said, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land. Normally, when we read of fishing in the Gospel of John, we take it to represent the project of spreading the message of Jesus. You will be fishers of men. You will bring people to God through the story of Jesus as the Christ. Such a reading certainly fits here. The disciples are instructed to cast their nets on the right side of the boat, just as Jesus sits at the right hand of God in heaven. But there's more to uncover. Part of this story is about failure, of casting nets into the vastest of the sea and returning with nothing to show for it. Just as the disciples had to confront the reality of failure, I think that we, as modern Christians, especially in America, have to confront some of the failures attached to how our message has been spread. How many of us know someone who had to recite gospel passages after a beating? How many of us were made to do so ourselves? When we see the message of Jesus Christ abused in public, how do we react? You see, it is common for Christians to be told to pick up the cross of Jesus, to be prepared to suffer for your beliefs against overwhelming odds and threats of violence and humiliation. But Jesus' message was not only about defeating death through faith. It was also about grounding that faith in care and love toward others. To take up the cross is to take up responsibility for how God is moving in the world. To lend your hand and heart and soul to the great purpose of caring for one another in a world bound and determined to make us domineering and abusive. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. And though there were many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. The disciples recognized the impossible, 
when they saw an apparition they could not quite believe was offering them sustenance and kindness in a difficult time. This must be Jesus, returning to them in an intense moment of need. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. The second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you that when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. How does one show love for Jesus Christ? One works to feed the lambs and sheep just as he does. We show love for God through our commitment to tend to the people both materially and spiritually as they struggle in this world. As stated, this is Jesus' third appearance to the disciples, still groping in the darkness after their teacher's death. Three times Peter is asked if he remains, despite the calamity that has befallen his community. Peter is asked if his faith is still rooted in love and demonstrating the care of God to the world through service. The great mystery of the Gospels is that to follow Jesus into death is to follow Jesus into life. What makes the gospel so liberating is that it takes the fear of death and transmutes it into a celebration of what makes life meaningful. We remember the love that cannot die. I submit to you that Peter's death glorified God because of the life he sought to live in love and devotion to his friend. To take up the cross is to live into love. Don't let anyone convince you that to pick up your cross is to seek a certain kind of death or to look to a world beyond ours for redemption. Our work is here and now. As womanist theologians have taught us, our God is one that journeys with us in our suffering. Our God makes a way out of no way. God cares and loves you right now, not despite your struggles, but because of them. Not despite your weaknesses, but because your weaknesses make you human. Not despite your moments of doubt and despair, but because of those very moments. Because in those moments, God is seeking to love and tend to you. Many scholars seem to overlook the fact that Frederick Douglass began his journey toward freedom through the Christian faith. That he worked as a preacher in the early days of his emancipation. And that Douglass always gave the credit for his strength in overcoming the trauma of ens enslaved youth to the glory of a God of liberation. When I shared the first chapter of my dissertation, Many of the readers asked why someone who heard the gospel recited over the broken body of a loved one would continue to worship such a God. In my view, the ability to find love in this God 
is the miracle of Christ's life and death. When Jesus says, follow me, he's inviting us into a community which defies the world and continuing its, its journey toward the God of love. What could be more liberatory? As I wrap up this morning, I just want to take the time to thank all of you once again for the space for me to write and think and live into my calling. Hyde Park Union Church is something unique, in particular in this city. It is a miracle to me that I have the privilege of raising my daughter here. I also want to encourage you to look for moments in this neighborhood, this village where we are located, that may call out for the demonstration of God's love. Feed the lambs and sheep when you can. Yeah. Tend to those in need, whether through charity or just by offering an ear to hear or a heart to feel. Yeah. But just as importantly, remember that you too are beloved of God and deserving of freedom and beauty. Sometimes we forget to tend to our own needs for love, community, and connection in trying times. Pick up your cross and follow Christ into life in abundance. Let out your nets in the security of God's grace. Amen. <laughs>